questions from the audience? This is the part where we talk for 45 minutes, so. I wonder if you can talk a bit about uh, lights. You talked about it as a medical tool, but how about as a psychiatric or psychological one? You mentioned that there are these sad lamps out there, but that must be an interesting phenomenon in the last 10, 15 years. Um, do you mean the mood enhancing? Yeah. Like as a, to, to promote happiness. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it's funny, is I'm, this course I'm teaching, I have my, my students are, uh, for their, their graduate students, and one MA student is doing a, um, is envisioning an exhibition about perceptual psychology from the 1960s. And she's looking at the role of um, psychologists and artists who were called light and space artists from the 1960s in LA, who did a lot of experiments with this. And one of them is named James Terrell. Mm -hmm. And he, has, he uh, has created these really incredible spaces that are meant to either withhold sensory like stimuli or to Get, like or to increase it and um, this this issue of light has been something she did it she did it because she knew why I'm obsessed with light but um, well not that's not why I wasn't getting it right but um, um, this is sort of where our very different practices kind of converge on this subject of light generally of what you might call as a matter of well-being right by which we kind of also include like psychological like mental well-being interestingly um, I've come across um, sources from, well actually today I was in the Osler and I was looking at a dissertation from Paris from 1820 and the title of it was called um, On the Happy Influence of the Sun on Human Health. That was a translated title. So um, this notion that happiness and, and light are fundamentally related I think is really fascinating and I think it's the idea that it's now used for seasonal affective disorder, which I think some could argue is a very like modern, or at least categorized, you know, in the modern era as a, as a disease or as a condition, um, I feel like uh, that's not coincidence. Like so, and if you look at uh, another development, which has become very like faddish and alternative therapy these days, which is called chromotherapy or color therapy, um, where they they have different colors projected onto the person to induce different mood states. This can also, you can find material like this back from like the 1860s in America. A fellow named Pleasanton, a mil um, he was in the military, did experiments about this, about projecting blue light, and that had a calming effect on people. So I mean, the, I, I, it's there, but, uh, uh, and I, again, I don't know, I, I find that most people I know talk about SAD, they just, they just they know about it, they sometimes, a lot of them have these lamps. I collect these lamps as well. Uh, I find the whole thing really, really fascinating. I don't know if you, did you bring it up because you have one? No, I just find it interesting how it was so quickly uh, incorporated into the general public consciousness. Like, oh, of course, not enough light will make you sad. And that's why we all seek out light in the winter. We all did it, I think, before, but without uh, maybe making this really a like, concrete link. And now it's just kind of taken for granted. Well, of course, that's why you would do it. So I think, yeah, I think the, the fact that it was so quickly, just now taking uh, like full head keys because of, of uh, that language. So you see it like as the latest trend? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. I mean, people are still vacationing down south, but before they might have said, oh, you know, for a change of senior or something, but now it can, it can, it can be a treatment. Yeah. yeah. I, well, my thesis was actually um, about the Cote d'Azur as of having always been a, a site for treatment, and it's actually one of the, the core areas where heliotherapy is developed by practitioners, and definitely because it was known as a region called the Pays du Soleil. So that's, I mean, they it, they just thought that it was, of course, you would, it was a matter of common sense to have it there, these kinds of sanatoria. Um, I brought, like, other things that you might be interested in. I, I was saying, saying to Elsa that I thought I had to, like, architecture this up, because mm -hmm. this is so not an architecture talk. Mm -hmm. And um, the, this one really interesting Frenchman named Dr. Jean Sedman, in, 1930, in the 1930s, he um, started building rotating solariums. Um, and this one's from aix les -Bains. And there was also one that was um, built uh, on the coast as well, on the south coast. And uh, I desperately want to get my own postcard of one of these on, on eBay because this seems to me to, to be like, especially also the kind of, um, the aesthetic, the, like the design of it as well, is kind of fascinating. And interestingly, um, Bovier claimed 
that Le Corbusier uh, came to his licensed sanatorium, like one of the sanatorium uh, up there. And uh, that's how he got inspired to include uh, rooftop terraces on the Villa Savoy, which I thought was a pretty significant claim to make. But the, the idea of modernist architecture being have, like influenced by you know clean white lines and um, open open spaces and uh, having terraces built as was was seen to be linked with um, this need this natural this need to to have also meditative spaces but also intrinsically healthy spaces and this is just an image of um, of the terraces that you, the kind of terraces that still exist this is from a children's um, it's now a children's hospital that's what it looks like today. So those terraces are still there. So these were fundamental to the heliotherapeutic treatment that you needed to have a have a terrace on which the invalids would be wheeled out in their in their cots. Um, but yeah, this this one's um, this one was known as Silvabel. It was it was opened in 1904 actually. Um, Well, a couple of things that lead off from that. I mean, are you comparing the, uh, the the period of time we're looking at here and the growth of, of heliotherapy with today's general development of spas and yoga retreats? I mean, it, it just seems to me that there's an equivalence and that there are both kind of real estate opportunities for people in the leisure, quasi-medical leisure industries. And the other question, which is not entirely related, is, um, your picture of the sort of Odalise with her allegedly cured skin. Yeah. Um, what were you really going to say about that? I mean, it, it, it could just be an excuse to take a picture of an elegant naked female. What was that doctor really interested in? Did you think I had a, a kind of a secret? No, I'm just wondering whether there's a whole series of these images <coughs> which are a kind of medicalized soft porn, basically. I think that's certainly been argued by art historians who study medical history with the, the, the photographs. The one that actually disturbs me the most is this one. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's exposing a very elaborate way of carefully only showing a part of the leg, but yes. why does the rest I of see, I see, as a, I, I've argued this previously actually, and um, a medical, a very well known medical historian um, was not convinced that I said that I find these images disturbing and like there's something uncomfortable about them and he said well this is just how they did it so like like I mean one of them of course is to the to the uh, to maintain the anonymity of the patient but um, this is clearly a boy mm -hmm. so here I find the androgyny of the image also very um, disturbing and as and as you point out the kind of the fact that the nudity is not necessary to what is being shown here um, and in fact, this image, I wasn't allowed to include it in the Osler exhibition that I had because there was a concern about child pornography um, from the lay public, that this was a, cu the cu a curator's uh, or the librarian's concern. But to return to this one, I think in a way, um, I, I don't, I mean, well, you could say the same thing about um, mm -hmm. This is amazing, yeah, photo, which is not really a photo, but a series, like, I think it's actually a, some sort of, yeah, montage. Because this, is, by the way, is impossible, as you would say. I don't know how that could just keep going. <laughs> um, I am trying to think about the kind of sexual content of these, because I do find it very fascinating, and I don't see it as specific to heliotherapy, um, or to phototherapy in this case. Um, I don't think that I'm knowledgeable enough about the kind of broad use of photography in, in medicine as uh, overtly sexualized. So I, I don't, and I don't know what these who call like late intentions or subconscious urges of like Kellogg or Bernhardt were, but that woman was clearly a patient. <coughs> this woman is clearly not a patient as we can see by the fact that she, everything about her screams studio model. <laughs> but that other woman was shot on a terrace in Samadin where, where Bernhardt's facility was. So there, like, this is the interesting kind of tension here, where the, it doesn't seem to me to be a medical, like, it's not doesn't function as a medical document, as a visual document, and I think therein lies some uh, teasing out that I'm only just beginning to do. Your other, your first question though is interesting because I think even today in France, um, the 
government still covers going to spas <laughs> as medical therapy, just like doesn't our healthcare cover having massage? Yeah. And yeah. Certain private people's yeah, medical private, work. Yeah, private yeah. Not public. Yeah. So that's private. No, I mean, my mom works for like the region of Peel, and so it's covered in her like allowances or whatever for medical benefits. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually don't know whether you could talk about a broad continuum of so-called alternative therapies that have become mainstream, mm -hmm. or like where that divide is between something like a spa culture, which posits itself as like generally about well-being, but also about beautification. Like it's a place where women like not only chill out, but also like have a facial. Um, I, I feel like that there's definitely the same kind of thing, perception about light therapy that it exists with water therapy. So that it is both rejuvenating phys physically in a therapeutic context and also aestheticizing in a beauty, beauty con like context. And that these are actually complementary processes. So that one gets healthy and pretty like at the same time. So I don't think it ever went away. Like I, this, this kind of like alternative. Uh, like, I don't know about yoga, actually, I'm afraid I, I, but certainly the spa culture, like, I think it's like, it's, it's never gone away. Like, I don't know if right now it seems like it's in our face, but I feel like it's always been there. Uh, maybe it's country specific too, I don't know. Did that answer your question? Too? Yeah, it definitely gives some way. I mean, I also think there's a class issue involved here, and I'm curious to know whether you do know much about the, the actual origins of any of the people shown, like the woman who's faced with lupus before and after, and, and the fact that these are images at not the very beginning of photography, but in its first few decades of real distribution of those kinds of images that sort of comparable the, the shots of sick children to, in my mind, the shots of, of child laborers in the factories from you know, the Lewis Hine era. So is there some connection between who's attending these spas and their need from having been you know, an impoverished urban or work circumstances? That's a really great question. Sometimes um, there, Rolier did have, um, there is in one pamphlet, a listing of the costs for attending, mm. being in one of these sanatoria. Um, certainly you couldn't go to these places without paying, mm. unless it was specifically designed for, for as a charitable sanatorium. Mm -hmm. And those did, did exist. Um, they were philanthropic projects. So, but being able to identify the class origins or the actual like biography of any of these patients is impossible. They're all anonymous. And so I also find it really frustrating because um, I want to know desperately like who went to these places. Um, I have never been able to get to a point where I've seen like case records of like the of the people that came. Um, and I feel that it must have been, you must have had to have had money to be able to afford these treatments, especially because they took months. Mm -hmm. So it would have implied that one had the, had the leisure time to, to behave that way. So I, I, I wish I knew, actually, but I think it classes. And also, it's like, yeah, how, why would she allow herself to be photographed that way if she was one of these patients? So I think we just kind of distinguishing between a model and an actual sick invalid. Is, is difficult. Like this woman is clearly being paid to pose like this. So this would not have been a, a woman of any particular social standing. She, she would be dressed in like what looks like a latest 1920s kimono, so kimono, and the frilly undergarments and these lovely heels and the latest 1920s crop. Let's also consider that. So she seems to as though the height of fashion, but she couldn't. It can only be a, a, her dressing up to the camera. Um, I'm not. I'm not an American historian, like sort of, of, of American medicine. But Kellogg is pretty amazing. Uh, people think that he, people now call him a quack. But um, if you like, think of the amount of people that like went to his sanatorium in Michigan, uh, and the number of publications he produced, the number of consumer products he manufactured. His brother invents cornflakes. Someone else near him is Ben's Graham crackers, so that's the Graham. Like he started up a eugenic society in 1906 with a fellow named Charles Davenport, who was a scientist. So 
there's like a, he got a lot he had a lot of like you know fingers and a lot of honey pots. So I feel like I don't know I don't I don't know if I want to call him a quack because I feel like people just don't take him seriously when they really ought to, especially in the eugenic bent. Like come on, like that's kind of important. But um, if you think like I don't know if you've seen the movie The Road to Wellville with Anthony Hopkins. Does anybody else know this? It's based on a novel, so like a fiction. And it's it's it has like Bridget Fonda in it, and 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 it's like meant to be funny and ridiculous, and to play I think on the, our perception of the ridiculous, which is like that this is excessive and like overly sexualized and silly and was never going to work. But the, the point is that I think that they quite sincerely believe that it would work, and Kellogg clearly believed that it worked, and so I don't know whether I kind of disagree with the whole like take on Kellogg as a quack, because I feel like it's not a productive and critical view of his work in terms of how he was perceived at the time by his own medical community and by his own clients. So, um, yeah, I, I, he's, this is from a, a, second, a second edition of Light Ther Therapeutics, and the original was in 1910. And um, in the past, the, the difference between the images used in them were astounding. Like the, from this image to what comes before, it's a totally different image. It's of a man totally wrapped in a sheet, just with a hole where the light would shine, and he with goggles on. He looks like a mummy. <coughs> it's like totally the opposite in terms of like it's it's it looks restrictive and uncomfortable and painful and and like you don't want to, he doesn't want to be there. Versus this kind of experience, which just seems like like a like a party. I I don't know on her on her torso. So I. Um, <laughs> I, I think that Kellogg, like, I don't know if there's been enough written about this guy from a serious point of view, like, so something that isn't automatically trivializing. And I think, uh, you could, I think his records are still available, like, in, our, in archives in Michigan. So I've actually been hoping that, like, I've been wanting to read something critical about his work, actually. But you should totally watch The Road to Logo. The machines in it alone are amazing that they find for the, um, for the, uh, the therapies. There's actually, you can go to the, and see some of those objects. But like, you know, mirror lines, almost like, um, what do you call them? We put dead bodies in the coffins <laughs> <open. laughs> that you would be slid into. Yeah, or being mad at some Yeah. Mm -hmm. He invented um, certain, certain things as well. He invented the incandescent light bath, and he invented a phone four, and these were handheld heat lamps. And they still remind me of like how when it's cold, you put on your extra electric heater. Like it's the same kind of thing. So I, I think that the Kellogg like deserves a bit of a, like a little a little bit more. Definitely <laughs> for sure. There's a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the types of illnesses and conditions that were treated. I mean, you mentioned tuberculosis and yeah. a few others. Was there a set range of different conditions or illnesses that you'd say in this you go to? Heliotherapy, or was it illnesses that had no medical treatment or there wasn't a lot known about them? Um, that's a great question, actually. I find that most of them are related to different forms of TV. So <clears throat> the image of the, the woman with the, on the lupus on her face, that was known as um, tuberculosis of the skin. And then <clears throat> the most famous, of course, is pulmonary tuberculosis, which isn't kind of externally visible. Like, we kind of know it from this sort of wavish, white, like, waning woman. Like, that's the kind of way in which it's romanticized in visual culture. Um, the, and the blood, the spitting up of the blood in the handkerchief. So that's definitely, I've seen images of them trying to project the light just onto the chest area. Um, the most gruesome are usually tuberculosis of the lowest of joints, um, or like POTS disease, which I believe is also still related to TB. I think it's a malformation of the spine. So they're, um, they are generally related to TB in some form, um, which was certainly considered to be like the plague of, of that moment. Um, arthritis is another one that's usually used for. Um, in fact, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, these 1820s treatises talking about using it for some, like to some, to, as a heating source for the joints to like calm the, to calm the pain. Um, interestingly, just today in the 1820 manual, I saw reference to psoriasis, 
which is actually kind of unusual, um, because I just read this book by a guy named Guy Kennaway, who has written this like popular like autobiography called Sun Feeling Naked and Other Stories, and it's his biography of living with psoriasis, which is apparently like one of the most mysterious and disease and sunbathing is still like the like natural thing that you do for this. And I think because it is a kind of mysterious disease. Mm -hmm. And so like I, I think it is almost like it's like a last resort or something that you would try sunbathing. Mm -hmm. But they definitely have the electric light therapy, they do phototherapy as a as a condition, like as a, in the hospital treatment for psoriasis. Um T B Um scrofula would be the other one. But that is also the T B of the glands. So normally scrofula would see like a very large inflammation, oh, it's definitely with kids, of the glands here. So you, these very frightening like kind of lumps that would grow on their necks and it would be the kind of lymph, the lymph glands where they would get it, scarf it. So, but it's still TB related, mm -hmm. but those are the babies. And so was TB at the time where these were most popular, I mean it obviously seems like such a long time, but was there, was there not many cures or not many other treatments, is that why? I think they kind of thought of it as like the kind of magic, like mm -hmm. silver bullet, until say the 1940s and 50s when they developed drug therapy for it. And then that the story is that heliotherapy fell out of favor after that. So which would imply that it was primarily used for TB. Um, TB is such an interesting disease story though because I think the World Health Organization only a couple of years ago announced that it was not gone and it was becoming drug resistant, and or has always been a particularly drug resistant. So I think it also has that mysterious element to it. Um, yeah, that's right. Did I answer yeah. that? You guys can talk to each other too. You know, it doesn't just have to be. No, I have one question because you, when you are mentioning your family going south, uh, as yeah. well, so, I like to throw them and in the exhibition we have uh, Sun City that is this. Aging I baby. saw it on the internet, and that's why I thought of my grandfather as well. And I, I was wondering those. whether do you know or do you think that the Sun uh, was the is the primary, let's say, uh, marketing drive force for this kind of movement, or it's more climate? I mean, in which terms Sun is rhetorically used to sustain uh, winter tourism? Because on one hand, we we listen about uh, if you don't get the Sun, you get depressed. Uh, that is a driving force of tourism, especially for northern countries. Uh, but how much is sun, in your experience, has been uh, marketed as a sun and therapy marketed as tourist, uh, tourist or real estate like uh, motors? Um, I can actually show you pretty incredible uh, posters from the 1920s and 30s of people like of bathers on the beach, like praying to the sun, with them saying like, like if the Le soleil toute l'année, like any time on the Côte d'Azur. So um, certainly it was a marketing ploy, um, not specifically for the sanatoria, but to come to the beach, right? To, to come to the, to the coast and have your hotel and everything. Um, in terms of like the snowbird syndrome, I would say that that's part of a, a much longer, wider culture of um, winter tourism that is probably couched more in climate therapy, of which heliotherapy comes out. And I think that's really what it is. I think generally the South was known as a site of violence. <coughs> and for people who were convalescents or um, elderly, they were known to be weak, or they would actually describe them as like, mm. and to, to have this kind of weak constitution so that they could not, um, they were so overtly sensitive to the temperature change that they needed to be in a temperate, mild climate during the winter. So they were told to leave the north, especially like London and Paris, and to come down to the south for the whole winter. And I think that practice of annual winter tourism is something that we then see happening in North America, California, and Florida. And that I think now has become this normalizing practice that we don't even think of in medical terms anymore but I think it originates in medical prescriptions because climate therapy was, was a valid therapy in the 19th century and the 20th century. And I think I've actually argued that it's the basis for Cote d'Azur tourism, um, but that's me being like all medical about it. So, uh, but I think it's climate out of which the sun is considered to be part of, like an intrinsic part of. 
I think it's interesting to think of the sun as a natural resource that can be commoditized and maybe also uh, somehow a right to the sun. I think a lot of the dialogue around uh, in the 80s when Canada was thinking of buying uh, Turks and Caicos, uh, the MPs were talking about like every Canadian will have a right to a certain amount of time in the sun. You know, like it's not a bit like the US and the oil in the Middle East. You know, it's our oil, but it's under their sand. So it's kind of um, this interesting idea that for a while that there was almost a right to, to sunshine. I think this is definitely part of the holiday culture as well, yeah. right? That, that we have the right as workers to have allocate paid holiday time. And I think then explaining that holiday time as being part of going abroad, like that you wouldn't just stay in your house for two weeks, but that you need to go somewhere with your time off, that that is definitely part of travel. Like that that's part of the travel mentality, that you go there to rejuvenate. Definitely. I also need to go on my by because nobody else is going to mention it. I'm not sure that we can still talk about invalids in 2012. I think that's something that just needs to be said. Um, just showing showing that photograph first off. Was and calling strange. him an invalid? Was that a little Well, unfeasible? both the photograph and and then using that term. Um, you talked about spectacle and um, clearly this is a man who's putting himself on show. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything that a person in a wheelchair could do that you might not think is spectacular. Oh, sorry. Um, that's not why I found that. Well, it seems that way. I mean, it, there's a, if you go back to the photograph, I think there's something interesting there, which is that there's a man behind and to the right who's even more sprawled out on the steps. Yeah, uh, and yet that, that is not a spectacle somehow. Like that is not something that we go and photograph. What's interesting is the man in wheelchair because this person is somehow other and somehow different. So I think that that's something. I was totally, because yeah. I was into the medicine, I was just wondering like why he was doing that. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, I know you're used to looking at images all the time, but he was right there. There's no reason to not go and talk to him. Like, I'm not saying you have to get all sophisticated. I didn't want to. <laughs> it's much easier to, to look at an image and project what we want onto it. See, of I, don't going, do, uh, I don't do. I understand, but why not? Analysis. He's right there. I, don't take surveys, I think you so would get much more interesting data to have actually, a talk with him. Well, yeah. I would like to find him actually. I think you should. But I didn't want to disturb him. It was kind of like if I was. I wonder how about disturbing it would be privacy. if he was sitting here now, hearing all this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's. He's gonna be mad. Yeah. Well, he might. Be. Yeah. He might be pleased. No, I think he's gonna be really. <laughs> I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if he was upset. Um, that's interesting too. Like um, how I define the word invalid. I think yeah. that would definitely. Um, right. Uh, that was me. Sort like making a historical link between. I, and it makes sense in 1912 on the sanatorium to talk about invalids because that's the way that we refer to those people. Yeah, and I also use it um, to include a whole range of. of um, people seeking different kinds of therapy, proceeding or or being diagnosed as sick. So, um, and this person might not even be sick. This person might be living a very happy, healthy life in a wheelchair. It's true. It was my um, reading. So projecting, like somehow he is seeking therapy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's totally my I reading. think that's something that would be conscious of. But that's interesting. So you, what you are saying is that basically we should not be projecting our ideas on images? Um, especially not we when, image, ask, when we, we take we images. We should ask the images. <laughs> I know historians. Do this no. all the time because you're looking at stuff that's very old. But when you've actually taken the image, in fact, you haven't even taken it yet. If you go and but I, it I, I don't have an answer, but it's it's, a, it's an interesting no. question. Obviously, <laughs> whether we, we can or cannot, uh, we need to images. Be critically think about ourselves and what we are projecting on those images, and we need to take them into account. Absolutely. Um, but then on the other hand, we know that it's her position of the image, so you can project something else. Well, now, actually, it's now a fiance who took it. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. but, but now you're projecting that perhaps the man is happy, so. The image is there and it's open to interpretation. Yeah. So where, where, where is your point of difficulty of having taken the image, having using it? Oh, uh, I mean, I don't know if you heard there like several points there. <laughs> no, I've heard that, yeah. but I, I'm not really sure that I understood where is the criticality, having okay. taken the image or interpreting the image? Um, because you say that the image... Finding this is being a spectacle, whereas, for example, the man behind, this is not a spectacle. So first off, the subject of the picture, uh, in and of itself, it's because of the man's disability. So that, that is what makes this interesting. So then, and then um, taking the picture without permission and not even going and asking him about what he's doing in the sun, you know, and then instead using the picture as, uh, as an example of, of how people are, are, uh, are doing spectacle with the sun when really it might be a guy who's on his way somewhere and then stop to, as, as most of those people are doing, stop to enjoy the sunshine. Um, but this is something that he cannot do without somebody thinking that it's a spectacle. That is the point that I'm making. Mm. The difference, of course, is between yeah. the actual reality of what was happening at the time and now us looking mm. at an image of it, right? There's a, there's a disconnect there. 
And yes, the fact that I not only am the one interpreting this image, but was the one that asked it to be taken and set up, I think that's where there is definitely something to be said there. I, I, I think you're worried, in fact, about the political correctness of the use of designating him. You know, I think 50 years from now, we might look at a presentation like this in a book, or look at this picture in a book, and think of it the same way that you're looking at this picture of a naked person with the caption saying, you know, notice her. What we think is interesting now, I think, uh, in the future, we'll say, now, isn't it interesting that they thought that was interesting? Um, so I guess if it's possible to project yourself in the future and, and yeah, think about your own, <laughs> the own, your own lenses that you're using when you, when you look at this. Yeah, no, I had a very um, specific purpose in mind when I asked this for, for this photo to be taken, and then cropped it, and then showed it here, and then I sort of recontextualized it. Yes, I'm glad that you're aware of my bias. <laughs> I'm glad you are too. It was interesting too that you were talking about the term invalid. Yes. I think in the exhibition. Invalid. Invalid. Uh, it's very clear what it means. Yeah. OK, because I was thinking Somebody who has no validity to society, okay. which is how they used to be described. Anybody who was in any way not, not that what we think of the healthy and walking around on two legs. Yeah, which the exhibition, I think, is also talking about what is what is healthy. Well, obviously, we realize yeah. now it's a spectrum of all sorts of ways yeah. to be healthy, and it doesn't mean necessarily being able to run you know, a mile in 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, so it, was, yeah. it was interesting to get that analysis of that mm -hmm. word. And maybe that term will be reclaimed someday. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There are lots of quick terms that have been, uh, but right now to use it is really not very helpful for English. Jean-Louis. Vous avez parlé des scènes d'Orient dans cette France du Sud. Vous voulez savoir est-ce que dans les registres vous voyez plus de gens qui viennent de des pays nordiques qui descendent qui vont faire faire de l'idéotropie, des thérapies? Um, yeah, I, sorry, my French is crap, but you're saying, is it mostly Northerns coming to the South or locals using it? Statisti like statistics, like, or... Um, interestingly, the people who lived in the South of France are written out of the history of the South of France. If you read any book about like historical desert, it is always about the British, mm -hmm. the Germans, sometimes the Russians, and then the Americans. There are no French people in the narrative until 1936, the pays congé. Is that how I think? Yeah, the statute, the government issued holiday time, the paid annual leave of 1936. And I have lit, read quotes that actually say, now the French knew to use their own resources. Yeah, and I think that that is totally inaccurate because I, I specifically look at French tourist guides, French images, like French posters that are clearly speaking to a French audience. I think most importantly the people coming to the Côte d'Azur were from Paris. Maybe perhaps not like numerically speaking, I got, and I, I, that needs to be done by counting the number of people in hotel, um, when you would write in your name in the notebook in the hotel. Mm -hmm. People have tried to do that, actually. A um, man named uh, Charles Haug has tried to do that. And he has said that the majority were British, and therefore that it was actually like a British colony. That's how it's been described. But that's because no one ever looks at any of the French material. And it's all like hundreds of thousands of tourist things written about this place, medical dissertations written about this. And um, as for locals, they are always written out of the narrative, unless they were hotel leaves, or the people that um, that uh, produce the lemons, and like the different kinds of um, citrus fruits that were famous, like the, uh, the people that maintain like the orange trees and the lemon trees that were famous on the or the people that worked in the, um, like in places like grass and produced the, the perfume with the lavender. So I think those, they are positioned as um, workers who facilitate the tourism industry. And the only other thing I've ever come across in my own research has been by the people that um, created a train, a train network that ran along 
western edge of the coast, which was known as the Mall. And it was the area from Ia to San Rafael. And there was actually a train that a train line that went along that the local businessmen and mayors got together from um, the different communes in, in the department of the VAR and um, proposed to have the line built for tourism and to facilitate industry, like the moving of goods along the line. That's the only thing I've ever come across about like local um, agency um, in this region. But when it comes to tourism, if you look at the where these things were published, it's always like Londres, Paris, Bruxelles, uh, and then maybe like New York. If like later you get some New York stuff, Toronto stuff, um, and then places in Germany and Switzerland, Russia. So it's very much a northern fascination with the south as part of a very long history. One more question, please. I was wondering how do you think that the sun affects like the defined the cultural idiosyncrasies of certain countries? I mean in terms of you know it's like far away from the medical, medical side but related to psychology, how do you think that that uh, mean that countries that have more sun is a lesser level of stress or that people can stand it better? I think that that's a straight relation. From, from a historical point of view, I see where it comes from, that belief. Um, the kind of stereotype of a southerner is someone that is carefree, fiery, right? Like, uh, like easy to be angered. Um, so easy like, um, easy like a hot, hot tempered, as we would call it, which is a direct connection with the climate. And um, also um, uh, not bothered and languorous, having the siestas, like, you know, like kind of takes life, like however. I think that belief is so ingrained now in our perception of places like Spain and uh, the south of France and Italy and then also over to like South America. I think that is absolutely like part of the way in which it's like part of the self-fashioning of those cultures, but actually it's very much linked to like ancient medicine that different places, different climates brought about certain types of personalities. So that the actual soil and climate would produce people of certain hum humoral qualities. So the sanguine temperament of the, where there was more blood in the four humors uh, was known to have a fiery temperament. And I think, and then they were known to be hot-blooded. And, and I think these things then get attached to places. And um, for example, the, uh, in the 19th century with racial theories, the Asian was always known to be phlegmatic. And this was based on a direct color relationship about like yellowness, like yellow skin. And, and so there's like really interesting like medical and like historical explanations for this. But I totally think that they like that people from that country totally believe that like they are all like passionate and like quick tempered and happy and like very like it's I think it's very much part of the self fashioning of that culture like that the identity of the culture. Stereotypization as well. It's sorry. Stereotypization. Yes, absolutely. For the way in which they want to be understood by everyone else, absolutely. Yes, and I know a lot of people from the South who behave that way. And it's part of the way that they were raised to behave in that in that manner, for sure. I can tell by your accent that you are probably from one of these places. Yeah, from South America. And I lived in Spain for a long time, so I had the two perspectives. And it's very sunny, sunny places. I never realized the lack of sun or how it could be affected from six sun so much until I came here. Uh, and what in, what was your experience like now? So what was that experience? You then realized that you took it for granted, or that you never realized? Yeah, you never like you enjoy sunny days, and maybe like uh, I come from Argentina, where that's a lot in the center, and then we in Barcelona, and it's like 360 days a year sunny, basically. So it's you give it for granted. You give it for granted, like you take here, like you do things just because I'm following the center, like. 
have it in abundance, and, and until it's like it becomes something that you don't have, you don't realize that it's something that you really need. But that's a psychological need. So you, just, do, you do feel that you psychologically need to have it? Yes, I experience and I think I know what happens to people here in France and Asia. They can't stay gone, but it's like, I'm saying sometimes it's like terrible. It's like, I can't still like, yeah. handle it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it has to be this, or otherwise I'm getting nuts. So it's a lot of... Uh, has he bought one of those lamps? No. Should buy one. I was thinking, try one. Go on Amazon. Try Amazon. You might, yeah, not too expensive. Some of the cheaper ones are much better. What I find like the price is like that, like, yeah, like how they came to me, how they Like get to it. It's before it goes, and, and that's how precious it seems to be. 